that fretful, hey girl text at one o'clock in the morning, the night before your hair appointment that's booked specifically for your birthday celebration. The claims of having to go to funerals. The car not working, they need to drop their kids off at daycare. What, whichever way to the very vague, oh, I have to take care of something. Can I change your appointment? <laughs> that is the tip of the iceberg to the trauma we have all experienced, particularly in this age of the Instagram hair stylist. And we're going to get into it. Hey guys, it's Julesy. And today we are gonna be diving into a topic that if you follow me on Instagram, you know I definitely have thoughts, opinions, my own frustration, my own anger to discuss over Instagram stylists. But of course, as a historian of black American women history, I always have to give a little historical context because I definitely think uh, there is, well, it's not even that I think, I know there is a historical link between what we are currently experiencing in the age of the Instagram stylist and broadly speaking, the Instagram entrepreneur, and then this call for the return to the salon era, which somebody with 4C natural hair, I have very distinct memories, okay? <laughs> Is it rose tinted glasses? Was the salon really that amazing? Is that really what we wanna to return to? We're gonna talk about all those things and also provide some historical context because hair care for black American women is both cultural and political. And I'm not saying this to say that no other ethnic group experiences hair, the care of our hair, the beauty trends and styles as a political and cultural movement Plenty of ethnic groups do because I used to get my eyebrows threaded at the um, Indian salon, babes. I lived in New York, so we've all had a little experience or two at the Dominican hair salon. And I've seen enough on TikTok to know that the white girls are having their own balayage drama as well. And so I'm sure there are points that everybody can extrapolate from this. And nor do I want to participate in slandering black women as if somehow we have this unique harm or scammery that we perpetuate. <laughs> I think a lot of us want to enter this discussion from the perspective of just the lackluster customer service experience that we have all had at some point in another in attempting to procure all hair care. Fretful, hey girl text at one o'clock in the morning, the night before your hair appointment that's booked specifically for your birthday celebration. The claims of having to go to funerals, the car not working, whichever way to the very vague, oh, I have to take care of something. Can I change your appointment? <laughs> that is the tip of the iceberg to the trauma we have all experienced, particularly in this age of the Instagram hair stylist. And we're gonna get into it. You know, I'm gonna give a historical perspective, but I'm also gonna share some personal teas because I don't been through it and I too am over it. But since this topic is going to be focused on what is essentially small black business owners, this sponsorship that I have with stamps.com is the perfect time. And then before we get too far into it, baby, you know I got my own candle line. Well, not mine. It's the SBG Book Clubs candle line, my nonprofit book club. So none of this money comes to me. It all goes into our nonprofit that helps us to make reading accessible. And we have a line of literary candles that are made, they're actually aromatherapy. So this one is clarifying it's gonna set the mood i hope to clarify some souls to understand that customer service is important creating a great ex customer experience from beginning to end will get you the coin will help you get that lifestyle in time rather than just thinking that you can stack a bunch of clients in a day knowing you ain't finna want to do it <laughs> and you're gonna cancel on everyone anyway because you're trying to live the lifestyle rather than actually provide a good service <laughs> i hope to clarify you know, clarify that in your spirits. Clarifying is in honor of Lucille Clifton. Say it loud and it will be beautiful, all right? We're gonna say it real loud. Customer service matters. Mmm, Ashe. And that's why this sponsorship with stamps.com is so 
perfect. This is broadly speaking for the entrepreneur, the person who is selling things that they have to ship to you and plenty of black hair care, whether it's natural hair care products or you know, I have my own KS hairline, okay? We do a little pre-sale, all right? And stamps.com has been integral to my experience as a small business owner. It provides the best shipping experience because we know, especially in the age of COVID, all right? The post office might not be so kind to the small business owner anymore when trying to ship packages. And I have a special URL from stamps.com that will give you four weeks free on the platform and also send you a digital scale, which is very helpful because you might measure everything at the get-go and then you try to elevate your customer service experience and get new packaging and oops, you gotta remeasure everything all over again. Ask me how I know, okay? I might re-sign up with my own link. I'm already a stamps.com customer, I've been so for years, but that little digital scale and that four-week free trial, mm, it's good. Stamps.com elevates the shipping experience and really the post office experience at, at large. They do work with two national American carriers, UPS and USPS, to help you deliver a more efficient shipping experience as you send out your customer packages. And I will say, after we just did a KS Hair pre sale run, and you know, I had maybe 30, 40 packages to ship. And using stamps really just expedites the process. It allows you to go in and set up standards based on different sort of products and packaging that you typically use, the manifest that you have easy access to at the end because you know some some, some post office workers don't want to scan individually for you and baby when you when you ship in luxurious products. You need proof that it actually made it to the <laughs> <laughs> to, the, to the carrier in the first place, okay? Tracking numbers ain't enough. I need my ish scanned. And Stamps makes that very, very easy, very, very seamless process. I cannot show you my own personal dashboard because <laughs> that's a violation of privacy, right? Too many, too much personal information from me to the customer on the dashboard. But trust me, Stamps.com is that girl. And I'm so happy to be able to work with a brand that I use. If you notice, I only work with brands that I have personal reference to, that I can integrate in my life. Oh, you know, check out the SBG sweatshirt, okay? Shout out to Nina, Audrey Lord, and Octavia Butler. <laughs> We have so many products at the SBG Book Club that help to pay homage to black literary icons and also help to fund the work of the book club cohort as we uh, target against dis and misinformation in the black digital landscape and focus on making reading accessible, okay? Now let's get into this. Black beauty hair care in the landscape of American history has a huge cultural and political impact. And there are several academic texts around this subject matter. Tanisha Ford has written books on black beauty and black fashion. The book that we're actually gonna reference in this video is Dr. Tiffany Gill's Beauty Shop Politics, African-American Women's Activism in the Beauty Industry. But Dr. Tiffany Gill has a great book that particularly focuses on as in the title, Beauty Shop Politics, and the history and the evolution of black hair care and how it fit feeds into the broader spectrum of black cultural politics. And I think it's important to this idea about the Instagram stylist vis-a-vis -vis the Instagram stylist scammer, the frustration that we as black women are experiencing and trying to book these women and get our hair done and the access and the inequity that exists in this space. There's one thread of this discourse that quickly says, well, don't go to a stylist if they're not licensed. And there is a particular reason why there exists this dichotomy between licensing and non-licensed hair care providers in the space of black hair care. Because state laws and policies, as with everything in the United States of America, when it comes to licensing for hair care, have invested in racism. Racism is embedded in our political code and that includes hair care policy that would be adjacent to how black women enter into getting licensing and becoming entrepreneurs and hair care providers and then broadly speaking how black women access their own hair care services. In the current political landscape, when you have laws around licensing for braiders, in that in some states, braiders are not allowed to wash hair. So when there's this movement on social media, now the girls are offering wash services 
they've had to work around certain licensing requirement for as a hair care professional because the service one that they offer in braiding is largely not covered in hair care schools. So various cities and municipalities and states have different sorts of licensing for braiders versus for people offering different types of hair care service. Until recently, a lot of those policies outlined that braiders would not be washing hair. Now, me personally, when it comes to getting my hair braided, I don't necessarily want to have my hair washed at the same time that I'm having my hair braided. A lot of braid styles are hour long experiences in the chair and adding a wash for someone like myself is like literally to wash, deep condition and detangle. And the girls always wanna trim. That's like two extra hours to a seven hour experience already, babes. No, I'd rather come with my hair washed and detangled. But that's just me. Other people have different means. I don't wanna discourage braiders from getting into whatever licensing they have to procure in order to be able to offer wash service to their clients because options are always great, especially options that you can fulfill. <laughs> but that would be one of the ways in which policies are kind of set up to keep black women out, okay? You are offering a service, braiding hair that is very particular to one community in the United States, then individual states will set up various laws that make it inequitable for how do most braiders get started. To make a generalization, oftentimes the way somebody comes into becoming a full-time braider is they learn how to braid within their household. And it's often a position that they take on out of some sort of financial inequity, right? This does tend to be a career field and a pathway for black women who are coming from lower economic status to elevate themselves to having a full-time career as an entrepreneur where they can provide for themselves and, them, and their families. And so the laws and the various state laws around braiding and how they define that different from a hairdresser have in some ways work to keep these sort of black women disenfranchised. That if you wanted to offer a more robust set of services, simply adding this idea that I'm going to wash and detangle hair means that you now have to meet the state requirement for a hair care license where you're not really going to get any information on caring for the types of hair that you do as a braider. Do we see the dichotomy that exists? And then if you're talking about a group of low income black women wanting to enter into an arena of entrepreneurship that offers them a career path, telling them that they have to go to hair school and possibly feed into the student loan conundrum that they've tried to avoid in the first place, forcing a person into hair school just so they can wash hair as part of their braiding experience does create a broad path of inequity. And then what knowledge do they really gain from this experience other than having to give the state time and money in order to give their black women customers a more robust service. But to get to the root of what really is happening here is we do go back to what Dr. Tiffany Gale talks about in Beauty Shop Politics. Um, when she talks about the moral panic over black women's migration, when you go into what we call the progressive era, so the late 1890s into the early 1900s, where you see this uptick of black migration to the North and laws that come about because white people are like, oh no, the Negroes are encroaching into our space. We wanted to, we wanted to abolish slavery, but we didn't want them to be our neighbors. And as black women migrate to the North, there is this moral panic and that they're gonna add to the blight, to the grime, to the poverty of the city because they cannot, particularly black women, they cannot be employed or used for labor causes in the same way that black men could go into factories and in hard labor positions. Even if your only like frame of reference for this kind of history is the Netflix documentary on Madam C.J. Walker, which I personally didn't think was that great, but you know, there's a utility. Hey, we can't knock everything even if we have our own critiques about it. 
But if you remember, if you go back to the Madam C.J. Walker series that came out on Netflix, what, a year or two ago, that kind of overviews her rise and prominence as a black woman in the Midwest who created a hair care product and was able to become an entrepreneur. And I don't know if the if the series really honed in successfully into how much Madam C.J. Walker had to fight and really she had hair, what allowed her to create that product line and make it successful was that she launched, enabled the, the black women salespeople to have salons and do hair for black women and showing the, the value of that within the black community that even black men, like prominent black men, initially turned their nose up at this concept. Hair care and hair care services were one of the few ways that black women could avoid falling into the traps of becoming a domestic worker or a sex worker and have a job that allowed them to provide for themselves and their families. And therefore, hair salons became a very entrenched part of the black community because black women and black people at large were able to retain ownership over the, these salon spaces and not be overcome so easily by white business owners who would e use various tactics to take over or consume a business and not just an individual business, but the entire lane of a business, right? When you think about like black newspapers, black journalism, black media, why there aren't more black garbage collection companies or, you know, industries that we use day to day and we don't even like think about it. Why are there not black owned grocery stores? Because white people were able to successfully block out these black businesses. But in the hair care industry, because their services are so unique to providing for the distinct textures that exist within the African-American community, it was not something that white people could come in and take over. And so because of that, hair salons become entrenched within the black community. We have organizations like the National Beauty Culturalist League, even specifically in North Carolina, it's another history book, Christina Green's Our Separate Ways, highlights how several black beauty schools rise to prominence in the state. And all both these organizations, these schools and various black hair salons become centers of civil rights organizing. They become centers of community organizing that aid in the success of the civil rights movement. Now that is not meant to excuse any bad behavior. What, I'm, what I wanna make clear here is that this success, you know, um, the United States of America does not allow, allow black success to go unnoted. They love to burn something down, right? And there wasn't one thing or one area for them to burn down here. So what we get instead is racism in black hair adjacent laws, right? As I've already stated, we've heard this over the years about the, the lack of education on black hair care in these hair schools. I would love to just be able to simply make the argument that black hairdressers, black beauty culturalists, black Instagram stylists, whatever they call themselves, should all collectively go through the proper government oversight that allows them to get the license and then maintain their license through the year. The problem is that a lot of this licensing and the laws come down to individual states. They all have a history of racism and disenfranchisement around the labor of black women. Black hair care was seen as a threat to black women being removed from low labor positions. There hasn't been a holistic approach in the United States that I can truly believe in, that at this point, the idea that simply getting a license is going to resolve our problems. I would love to believe that, but there's also a way in which the, oh, well, you should only go to licensed hairdressers, it reinvests in classism. And it doesn't think about at all the inequity in what that pathway to licensing really means, especially as black women at the very base of this is that hair care has been a means for low income, poor, working class, whatever, black women to ascend or to have more possibilities of ascension to black middle class status. I do think there is a vein of this discourse we're calling for either the hairdressers to all be licensed or for black women to only go to licensed hairdressers. 
is also a, a matter of it's a conversation that's steeped in class performance and aesthetics and it doesn't necessarily resolve the the issue at hand in what we're facing with all the scammery that's going around with Instagram stylists. Now I've already touched on the historical perspective of black hair care and black hair salons. Oh, but let me get to the point of what I think is at the foundation of the issue we are having with Instagram stylists. And also to me would kind of be why I don't know that this return to the salon is really going to provide the equity to black women as much as we believe it is. The running tread from the black hair care salon to the black Instagram stylists, they are all investing in a career path that gives them the possibility of class ascension. Now, the era of the black hair salon might participate in a different way of performing the aesthetics of black middle class in that your black hair care salon owner is not going to necessarily have the same aesthetics as an Instagram stylist. And it's even interesting that there's some shame and like, oh my gosh, the, the grass wall, the neon lights, you know, the aesthetics that black Instagram stylists have had access to kind of being turned into a, a low class signifier. I think the black Instagram stylist is going for the same thing that the Tina Knowles type hair salon owners are trying to achieve themselves. The difference is we might just be further into late stage capitalism and uh, I, and I think the difference is there's a convergence of s a few more things happening in this era than were happening in the 1980s or 1990s that lead to a, 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 a similar pursuit, but a different performance of class aesthetics in that pursuit. I don't think this idea that I want to do hair care and then the symbol of success in hair care is getting a luxury vehicle at a young age, I, that absolutely existed in the 80s and 90s. You can find plenty of pictures of black women hairdressers leaned up against nice cars to prove their association with success and therefore being valuable members of the black community. They don't know that there is this real distinct uniqueness between the politics of a black hair salon owner or black hair salon stylist and the politics of an Instagram stylist. I think the difference is in the era where the hair salon existed as our only option for hair care outside of the home, it was able to entrench itself as a valuable aspect of middle-class life. Instagram stylists and existing in the hyperdrive that the internet creates overall, where there is now not just a performance that a localized performance that might be happening amongst community members, but you need to be able to get online and keep up with the ever changing trend of wealth markers that people say you need to buy into in order to be seen as truly ascending socioeconomic classes. But yeah, the Instagram stylist now, it just feels even more, you're even more aware from the beginning that they are pursuing these careers in order to be say, to say that at 19, 20, 21 years old, they have achieved some level of success because look at how nice their nails look up against the, the BMW or Benz icon. Look at the home I bought at 21. And I think the larger anti-intellectual movement that's been happening on the internet where myths and disinformation are actually targeted at the black community on the internet and for black women that target often comes through black beauty politics, through the discussion of black hair care, even self care, skin care. Um, and this idea that like we want people to invest in individual pursuits. I do think that is the distinction that the salon is seen as a community center, but the Instagram stylist is being encouraged to do this as an individual 
do this on her own. There is not this idea that what the work they are doing or the way they engage in their career pursuits are for a community or a collective. It is a hyper individualistic pursuit, especially as we have now moved into the salon booth, individual style hairdressers. And I think part of that collectiveness that's lost is not only lost in the customer service that we are experiencing as black women attempting to access these stylists and get our hair taken care of, but also that these individual stylists in the long run are selling themselves short because they no longer truly exist in a community that can help them come to a better understanding of the necessity of business operations, of customer service, of how to think about your pursuit of economic stability, but also self-care. Because the thing that I consistently run into when I've had issues with booking stylists via the social media or just stylists, even if they, they're not always active on social media, but the individual booth stylists, right? They're not in salons. They're not renting a chair in a salon setting. They're in their individual rooms. They are taking clients on. I don't even think that all these girls go in with this, I'm a scam client, take their money just so I can live a lifestyle. A lot of these young women, and there's men and non-binary people in this industry as well, but these people get caught up in this idea that if I take this many clients, I can hit my 100K goal this year. And they're not thinking about their own need for rest, for restoration, for taking care of their own needs. And I often feel like every time I've had an appointment and it gets canceled like at the last minute, I'm like, yeah, these girls, when I clicked on their calendar and I see every day of the week is open to schedule an appointment, I realize that it's now a red flag. It's hard to deviate entirely from the individual booth style Instagram stylist because the salons historically have just not kept up with the trends. And so if I want a more trendy braiding style or hairstyle experience, I do enjoy that these individual stylists, and we've relied on calling them Instagram stylists, so we're gonna keep calling them that, but that they offer access to the ever-changing trends of hairstyles that are coming out. Even though I continue to book with them, I know that one of the things I like to see is if the girls have certain days of the week blocked off because those are their days off. I think a seven-day work week is insane. And if, especially when you're getting more complicated and more laborious hairstyles, like this advent of boho locks and the styles have to, the hair has to be braided down and then wrapped around. And that could take, you know, a copious amount of time and hand labor that that I shouldn't have the option to be able to book that any, every day of the week. You should have set days where you're taking on the more tedious tasks because you have thought about your own self-care and be in your ability to constantly show up at 100% for your customer. I think the girls are playing themselves out and I know they're playing themselves out because they are being informed by other people that whether it's hair care or even lash services, and I'm clearly a person that gets lash extensions, that they can just take X amount of clients per day and then they reach goals. There's no talks about licensing, about overhead, about taxes. It's just, oh, charge your clients a minimum of this and b- book this many clients in a day. That's unsustainable, that's unrealistic. But they were told to get into this industry based on the possibility of how much money they could make, not on both this providing a career path that they love and a service that they're really good at to their customer. They're not fulfilling a collective or community need. They're simply being sold on the possibilities of transactions that can be had. And that sells everybody short in this dynamic. Everyone takes an L. And then also when I talk about, you know, I I mentioned this anti-intellectual movement, but the overall social media push to encourage people to check out from a community or a collective experience, to become more isolated and individual and I can do everything on my own, I think in the long run does a lot of harm 
to us individually. And I particularly see the girls, especially when you get in, I don't know, is it is it hyperbolic? Is it just anecdotal to suggest that particularly when it comes to like what we consider trendier hairstyles? So right now, lace fronts, ponytails, uh, stitch corn rolls with the different shapes in it, you know, the baby hair hairstyles, that these women are being told that they can invest in an aesthetic and turn away the, from the community and they'll be fine individually. It makes us just a lot more vulnerable. And I think that's something that we are negatively experiencing. I'm hesitant to even suggest that it's simply from this sort of pursuing this type of aesthetic puts you in this lane of like Instagram stylist scammer. As a black woman, why would I, why do I have to turn my nose up or turn away from the innovations that are constantly coming out around black hair care? Why can't I celebrate that? Why is this seen as a negative within how we perform class? I love a good ponytail. I love a good lace front install. And I don't like how the derogatory conversation around the lack of customer service that might exist in these spaces also creates a lane for people to turn their nose up at this experience. Because I do think the lack of customer service broadly is rooted in the lack of equity that people from these communities that come into this provider experience are coming from. And you're trying to now, you know, Think about the, the way things cost for our parents' generation. And now you are trying to, you know, the girls aren't even always trying to live in a luxury apartment. They might just be trying to live in a, in a decent neighborhood and are still looking at $1,600, $1,700 in monthly rent. They may just be trying to get by in their Nissan Altima and they still are, you know, things and inflation has gotten a lot more expensive. And I, so I think it's going to be even harder if we don't address the sort of push towards an individualistic lifestyle that touches so many of the experiences we have in our day-to-day -day life now. And I think that is what's really undergirding this lackluster experience that so many people are having in 2023. Do we have rose tinted glasses on when it comes to the black hair salon. I, as a young girl with 4C textured hair, I don't have truly traumatic memories, but I don't have great memories of my mom taking me to the hair salon after begging her. I begged my mother to get a relaxer. And a lot of my experience in the black hair salon led me to believe that something was wrong with my hair texture, that something was wrong with the fact that I had highly textured coiled hair and that it was always going to be more labor for me to achieve any nice style. I mean, I'm a child of the 90s. So the hairstyles we were going for back then, you know, there wasn't a huge natural hair movement. It was the various cuts, what I like to call the Katrina cut, you know, a little short up top, a little longer in the back, the French roll, the pump it up, freeze it hair. You had to Get that is straight and up, up, up. I'm very appreciative that, you know, black hair care has evolved and, and innovated that I now have the ability to participate in more hairstyles. I love the advent of wigs and lace fronts because now I don't have to traumatize my own hair to get a super sleek ponytail. I can participate in these different styles as well. But when it, or my only option was the black hair salon, I had a very limited access to participate in trends and style innovations. And I did experience a ton of texture and so I do question whether this return to the salon and maybe I actually just went to the hair salon today. I realized that being able to go to the hair salon is also very much so as I kept saying, it is a matter of, of class performance. It is a middle class experience, broadly speaking, to go to a hair salon because typically it's also costing you more to get your hair done at the salon. Now that might be an argument because some of these girls are out of pocket with the way they are charging folks, babes. Some of these Instagram stylists and just trying to, to, to supposedly get higher end clients or do less labor are charging out they ass for 
prices. But historically, it was typically that, you know, a lot of us left the salon because the salon actually became more expensive than going to these individual one-off, you know, salon booth Instagram stylists. Everyone is trying to, whether they're in a salon and they're in a salon communal setting or they're in a salon booth setting, everyone's trying to fight back against late stage capitalism. And unfortunately, I think the Instagram worldies are suffering from this idea that the first goal should be the achievement of a certain lifestyle rather than the honing in of a skill, providing good service, and that being the way that they ascend to whatever socioeconomic status they are seeking to achieve. Becoming a hairstylist is not the quick way out of the labor economy, first of all. There's a lot of costs that come with it that I don't think these girls are educated on. And there's a lot of scammery that exists because of the rise of the black LLC movement. People don't necessarily know how to, within their particular states, achieve the right business operations set up that will allow them to ascend the economic or socioeconomic ladder that they are trying to achieve. And I think that is actually a thing that happens across stylists and salon owner. I wish that in the end there was one universal answer where every black woman at the very least in the United States of America, when she goes to book her hair care services, has an equitable selection. I mean, if capitalism was truly to our benefit, you, when you go to book your hair care appointment, you would be able across hair care services, across price range, you would, you would be able to successfully book various types of styles based on your means because this free market actually exists. But I actually think what we are experiencing and this failure that so many of us are experiencing in even if we go to salon, we might not be getting the styles that we want. If we go to a, a, a Instagram stylist, we might not be even be getting in the chair in the first place. It's a byproduct of the failures that late stage capitalism is placing upon us, all right? We're actually gonna close out this video with my own experience. You know, I've had my own experience where I, you know, the last experience that I've had with this was the Hey Babe text. I got it like two o'clock in the morning. She wanted to push my schedule back five hours and homegirl ran me through every excuse in the book a funeral a flight not a, a different appointment that she found out about at 1 a.m that she couldn't get a refund on and I as a customer was expected to move my life around and I played around for a little while because I knew ultimately that she just wanted to cancel my appointment but one thing I will say across the board when it comes to booking services if you are a person providing a service Stop telling customers that you knew better that, oh, you canceled them for a reason because they were giving you a bad vibe. Even if you genuinely are getting a bad vibe from a person, you should never tell a customer that. You, that's just a piss poor reason. First of all, it's a piss poor reason every time, even when it's true. And it shows your lack of business acumen when you're communicating that to the customer. If you need self-care, put it in your schedule. Okay, if you need to take a self-care moment and you didn't realize because life happens, there's a better way to communicate it than projecting that on to your customer base. And I've experienced this outside of, baby, I was, you know, trying to book services outside of hair care. I hate when business providers are like, oh yeah, your vibe was off anyway. That's why it's okay that I canceled on you. The day before? Anywho, girl, homegirl canceled on me and then I got on Instagram and shared the screenshots and I'm gonna share these screenshots right here, right now because, you know, the stories are a little funny but I do hope that we can get to a better system of things at some point in time.